you for all being here tonight. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Ecclesiastes 3. Uh, we're going to actually start reading in chapter 2, but the bulk of us, what we'll be reading is in chapter 3. I think here in this little section, we've got one of the most important aspects or, or the most important attitudes that the Bible teaches us. And as I say that mainly because we can track this thing all the way through the Bible, what Ecclesiastes 3 teaches from the preacher, you know, whom we know as Solomon. And what we're going to do tonight is start in chapter 2, work into chapter 3, and eventually end up in Acts chapter 17 with Paul's sermon to the Athenians. Because the thought that Solomon presents in chapter 3, at least it seems to me, is actually concluded in Paul's sermon in Acts 17. So we'll finish there. You know, if you got told one day that you're going to spend the rest of your life just doing the same things over and over again, if you got told that, you know what, for the rest of your life, you're going to wake up, you're going to go to work, you're going to come home, you're going to watch TV, you're going to go to bed, and then you're going to wake up and you're going to do it all over again, and that's all you're going to do for the rest of your life. Would any of us find that to be satisfactory? I think we would all despise that. Like, we would do anything in our power to make sure that's not what happened. And not necessarily that we don't all enjoy going to work sometimes or we don't enjoy getting to come home, but just the concept that I'm going to spend the rest of my life just doing the same things over and over again, you know, working for the man. That, that, that doesn't sound appealing. And I don't think that that sounds appealing to anybody on the face of the planet. What it is is, is that we're all looking for something more than that. And for us that do have to go to work or go to school every day, and we do get into these routines, even in those times, we are still looking for something more than this world has to offer. And that seems to be a universal truth. So I think Solomon is going to pull that out for us and explain some things for that about that topic here in this section. So this is what we're going to do. The first point I'm going to make is that we are all striving for something more in this life and that we are not satisfied. The second thing we're going to talk about is why that is. Why are we all striving for something more in this life than just working, going home, and going through a mundane routine? And then finally, at the very end, we'll talk about what God's purpose is for us feeling this way. And it seems to be God's handiwork that we're even experiencing these feelings in the first place. So let's first, by starting out and clarifying that it is a universal truth, that we're all looking for more. And as Solomon would put it, we are all striving in our hearts for something more. And we'll start that conversation in chapter 2, verse 17. I'm going to read through verse 23, and then we'll pause and we'll break it down together. Verse 17, he says, Therefore I hated life because of the work that was done under the sun, was distressing to me, for all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Then I hated all my labor in which I have toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he be a wise or a fool? Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I have toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. Therefore I turned my heart and despaired of all the labor which I toiled under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. For what has man for all his labor and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun, for all his days are sorrowful and his work is burdensome, even in the night his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. And if you're not familiar with Ecclesiastes, the word vanity just means useless, profitless. That it just means nothing is what we would say in a modern day language. So let's break that down together. He starts off with verse 17 talking about how much he loves work. No, he says the very opposite of that in verse 17, right? He says work on the earth is distressing and it's vanity, it's useless. And now he goes on to explain why working so hard and toiling all our life is vanity. He says the reason why is because we work hard for nothing, or he works hard for nothing. And even though he was very clever, and he was very wise, and he was very profitable in the things that he decided to go out and do, at the end of the day, 
it all meant nothing. And this is why it all meant nothing. Either A, you do not receive the hard things you work for, right? That's a possibility for all of us. We might work for 50 years for retirement that we never receive, right? We may work 50 years for a dream house that we never get. And that's just the reality of life. The other possibility is you could work your whole life, receive the thing you're after, but you only get it for a short amount of time. And you finally get that, you know, money you were saving up. You finally get that dream house you wanted. You finally get that special thing you've always been working for. But guess what happens? You all die. We all die and we leave it to somebody else. And that person that we leave it to, they may not appreciate it and they definitely don't deserve it. And especially, you know, to Solomon here, I think in his own personal way, worrying about his foolish son, Rehoboam, receiving all the things he's worked for. And if you know a little bit about the Rehoboam story, Rehoboam's only king for one year, and the Egyptians come and steal everything that Solomon ever worked for under Rehoboam's nose. So this is something that worried Solomon, and this is why he says the work on earth is distressing and it is useless because you never actually get the things you're working for, right? And then he goes on and gives any more detail when we get to the last part of that section, verse 22 and verse 23. In verse 22, he says, For what does man have for all of his striving, all his labor? The striving of his heart. And when Solomon says heart, he's obviously not talking about the, the organ, the heart, right? What is he talking about? No, he's talking about the passions of the soul, the desires of the soul. And every time you see Solomon say the word heart, that's what he's talking about. It's really what we would call the desires of the soul. And he says, his heart still strives for some type of fulfillment that cannot be satisfied. So even though he knows all work done is useless and profitless and vanity, he still can't turn his desires off in his soul for something, what? For something more. And he's still striving. He's still looking for some type of fulfillment, but he's not finding it. He even goes on to say that, you know, while he's trying to rest at night and and he lays down and he tries to go to sleep, what is his heart still doing? His heart's still churning, telling him and bothering him that it's not fulfilled. I need something more in this life and you're not giving it to me. And so it keeps him up at night. And I think a lot of us have had similar experiences. And I know a lot of us have been working out in the sun these past couple of weeks. And when we get home, we hit the bed and we go to sleep. All right. And Solomon even says something about that, that the working man's sleep is sweet. But I do think we've also had all these experiences where we go to bed at night and we're not beat tired. And we lay there and it seems to be when the rest of the earth gets quiet and we have no distractions those are the times that our soul gets louder and it starts bothering you and it starts bothering me and says, I need something more in this life than what you're giving me. I need some type of fulfillment and this life is not cutting it. And this is what Solomon is experiencing and he puts it out for us here. And one more final thought, this is true for everyone and I sincerely believe that. I don't think Solomon here is revealing some truth we didn't know. I think he's making an observation of something that we all already believe in. And he's just putting it to words so we can talk about it together. I've tried to preach Ecclesiastes 3 before, and I felt like I struggled to really make this point well, and people left more confused than understanding, and that's a problem. So I tried to do something different so we would all be at least on the same page with this that it is a universal truth that all of our hearts are striving for something more. When uh, Paul's trying to preach to the Athenians, and in Acts 17, he's trying to make them understand that same thought, that I'm not telling you anything new. I'm telling you something that you all already believe in. I'm just showing it as an observation. And I try to use Paul's tactic here by quoting their own poets for them to agree, or at least for us to agree, that this is a universal truth, that we are all, all over the world, striving for something more. So 
These are some of the things that your own poets have said. I have run. I have crawled. I have scaled these city walls, these city walls, only to be with you. What is that? I still haven't found what I'm looking for. <laughs> That's what you too wrote back in 87, right? And if you that are U2 fans, which I am not, but if you are a U2 fan and you know this song, what is this song really about at the end? Is it about a girl like he leads you to believe? No, at the end of the song, it's, it's actually about the Christ. And it's very easily apparent about the Christ with the cross allusions he uses at the end. But that's what that song's about, right? Is I'm looking for something more, but I can't seem to find it. What about this one? Some things our own poets have said. In the middle of the night, I go walking in my sleep. Through the valley of fear to a river so deep, I've been searching for something taken out of my soul, something I never lose, something somebody stole. I don't know why I go walking at night, but I'm tired and I don't want to walk anymore. I hope it doesn't take the rest of my life until I finally find what I've been looking for. Damon knows that song. That's Billy Joel, River of Dreams. And even in this song, I mean, it's, it's very apparent, right? I'm looking for something more in this life, and I can't find it. I hope it doesn't take my whole life to try to find some type of fulfillment in this life. And he even goes on to say that it keeps him up when? When does it really bother him? At night. Just like Solomon said, it bothers him at night, trying to find the striving of our hearts. Uh, what about this one? Now I'm looking to the sky to save me, looking for a sign of life, looking for something to help me burn out bright. That's uh, Learn to Fly, the Foo Fighters. And that song too, looking for something more that this life just isn't offering. Your head is humming and it won't go. In case you don't know, the piper is calling to you for you to join him. And the thought there is a little bit more complex, but the thought is, is like no matter where I go, I keep on getting this bothering in my mind, telling me I need to go find something better. And something better is possible, but I do have to go out and find it. And, and that's, of course, stairway to heaven. <laughs> and this is something Led Zeppelin believes in, right? Like there's something more in this life. I've listened to preachers. I've listened to fools. I've watched all the dropouts who make their own rules. One person conditioned to rule and control, the media sells it and you live in the role. That mainly talking about the mundane life, the life that doesn't provide anything more. And you go and you talk to people, you try to go talk to preachers, you go talk to fools, you go talk to anybody who you think can give you an answer. What do I need for fulfillment in my soul? And of course, it drives them insane, right? And what's this song, Sean? This is Crazy Train. You know, it's very apparent. And if none of these have appealed to you because you don't listen to good music, I, I think all, this one will appeal to everyone somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. There's a land that I've heard of once in a lullaby. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue, and the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. We all know that one. And what's the point of that song? What's the message? You know, there is something better. There has to be something better. And if the bluebirds can go there, why can't I? And so what have our own poets have said? Our own poets have agreed that we are all striving for something more. So that brings us to the second question. Why are we all striving for something more? Solomon gives us that answer in chapter three. Before I read, let me give you an overview of what this chapter is about. Verses 1 through 8 gives us one of the, the most famous lines of Ecclesiastes 3, which is the concept that there's a time for every purpose under heaven. And he gives us this very poetic balance, right? Which we all know mainly because the birds wrote a song in 59 and they stole the lyrics from Ecclesiastes 3, right? The birds, right? Yeah, David gave me like a crazy look. It's the birds. Okay. The other thing is what we're building up to is we're building up to the concept at the end of Ecclesiastes 3 that death is waiting for all of us. So we all have this time, this purpose under heaven, but what is time in Ecclesiastes 3? 
it's limited. We only have so many hours here on this planet and then it's over. Verse 20 really concludes that thought. All to go to one pace, all from the dust, and all return to the dust. And what is that? 78, Kansas, all we are is dust in the wind. So if you need to write a rock and roll song, this is the book you go to to get inspiration. Verse 1, let's actually pick up and do the reading here, knowing that this is what chapter 3 builds up to. It builds up to the end, to death. Verse 1 says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war in a time of peace. He gives us this beginning, and it's obviously very poetic, but he's saying as we live through our lives, we find all these different purposes along the way, and those purposes are very complex. We can't just say, well, I'm just going to be loving, and I'm going to love everyone and everything, and that's going to be my guiding light. You can't necessarily say that because even though for a loving person, there's still time for what? There's still a time to hate, right? There is a time in our life to hate wickedness and to hate Satan. There are things that are need to be hated. You know, you could say, well, I'm going to live my life with joy and with laughter, and I'm going to laugh every chance I get. But what does Solomon say to that? Well, yeah, there is a time for laughter, but there's also a time to weep and to grieve. So nothing is as simple as it seems, right? And it seems like as we live our lives with our limited time, we bounce between these different things. And we have to decide what's the right thing to do for this particular purpose right at this moment. So then we get to verse 9. Verse 9 and verse 10 says, What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. And I think the thought is here is a question. You know, at first glance, When you look at a person's life and they're having to bounce between all these different purposes, he says it looks like a useless mess at first. That you're just having to do everything in the moment. You're having to make all these choices. And it seems to be like going all over the place. And a man might look at his life and go, this is a useless mess. And then he even says things like this. What profit has the the worker from which he labors? You know, what profit is there to gain in this? me trying to do the right thing in the right moment. And a lesser soul would say, there is no profit. And I shouldn't have to be doing this. And I even think that maybe verse 10 is coming from a bitter place. These are just the things which God has given men to keep themselves busy or to keep them occupied. And and maybe that's the purpose. It's just we need things to do while we're here, so God's going to give us things to do. And that's the earthly perspective of 1 through 8. But then you get to verse 11. But from God's perspective, verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in his time. And what song do we have for that? Well, that's a hymn. That's where we get the song in his time, right? So he says, from our perspective, it's a mess. But from God's perspective, he makes all things beautiful in his time. And a wiser man or woman that's looking at their entirety of their life, they can look at all of those things and say, this was not a useless mess. This was God leading me to greater purpose. That these were things that have to be done in my lifetime so I can find true fulfillment. That he doesn't think it's useless. He thinks this is God's beautiful work that God took his time to do. And then if we even skip down to the last bit of verse 11, Maybe you have a comma there at the end of the last phrase. He says, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. And again, it's a sign of humility. He's saying, even though 
bad things happen to us. Sometimes good things happen to us. Sometimes those things make sense. There's still going to be a lot of time where things happen in our lives that don't make sense. But that's just God's nature. You aren't going to be able to look at things that happen on this earth that God has control over and go, oh, okay, I understand why God did that. You're not going to get to have that aha moment every time. Why? Because God's work is so big that no one can find out what it is from beginning to end. I heard the analogy and I thought it was pretty good. You know, a lot of women often will like sew quilts or some of them uh, will even like weave and they like make blankets and stuff. You know, if you're working on this tapestry or tapestry, you, you might look at a little thread and a little piece of it and you go, okay, well, that's just like a beautiful color yellow. You know, and it may not look impressive at all, but when you step back, what do you see? Well, you see the whole quilt, right? You see why every little part does it share and fits together into this beautiful picture. And that's how God works with our time. We may look at the little bit in our, in our magnifying lens and go, this doesn't make any sense. But from God's perspective, no, it all makes sense. He knows what he's doing. He makes everything beautiful in his time. And, and that's the point that he makes after leaving this, you know, really poetic thought. But he sneaks this line in in the middle of verse 11. We know we have limited time on this earth. That's what we're working towards. And if we have limited time on this earth, why do we spend most of it striving in our hearts? Back to chapter two. You know, if I've only got so many hours to live, then why do I stay awake at night looking for even more fulfillment? Why don't I just take the conclusion back in 224 that it would just be good for man to eat and drink and be merry? And let that be it. Why am I still looking for more even though my time is so limited? And verse 11 tells us, he has made everything beautiful in his time. And then the next phrase says, also he has put eternity into their hearts. And that's the answer to the question. You know, why are we all looking for something more? Solomon tells us right here. Well, because he put eternity into your heart. That's why. And it's not just my heart. It's just not your heart. It's every human's heart. And so now our heart, which is really our soul here, the fulfillment of our soul, bothers us and tells us, I need something more. I need something eternal. You know, when your stomach is hungry, you know, what does your stomach tell your mind? You know, your stomach tells your mind, hey, I'm hungry. <laughs> like, I'm not satisfied. I need you to get me something to eat, right? And if you just eat like a few little snacks, but you're still hungry, what does your stomach continue to say? This isn't good enough. Like, I need you to go find me something that actually will fill me up, right? And our stomach can communicate to our mind like that. You know, if you get a sunburn, especially the past couple two weeks, what does your skin tell you? You know, get me out of the sun. You're, you're going to kill me. Like, I need you desperately to help me, right? And your skin will communicate to your mind, it needs something more. You know, when you're passing a kidney stone, like, what do your kidneys tell you? I need serious medical attention. You know, there, there's communication to your mind that something needs help. Well, what does our soul do to us here? Our soul tells our mind, I need something more than what you're giving me. I'm not fulfilled. I'm an eternal creature, and I need something eternal to fill me up, and you're not giving it to me. And when does our soul usually like to tell us about these things? Solomon already told us. It's usually at night. When things are quiet and our soul speaks up and says, I'm eternal. I know I'm eternal. And I need you to put something eternal in me so I can be fulfilled. And that's why we're all looking for something more. So since our hearts all strive for eternal purpose, and that's what I'm going to say from here on out, because that's what I'm really talking about. You know, we have an eternal hole in our soul, and only something eternal can fulfill it up. And that's our eternal purpose. Well, then we all try to find eternal fulfillment in different things. And I think this is where it gets hairy because we don't always choose the right thing to try to satisfy that longing of the soul. 
And I could have put four things up here that are sinful and say, you know, here are four wicked things that we all try to do to fill up this eternal part of ourselves. And that would have been fine, but I didn't want to make that point. I'm not interested in making the point that sin is bad. That's something I think a Sunday night crowd can understand. Do people try to fulfill themselves with evil things? Of course they do, right? People will look to every sinful thing they can find to try to fill up that satisfaction of the soul. But does it work? No, it never works. But what I wanted to do instead is, is show us that sometimes we'll try to fulfill up this bottomless hole with things that aren't necessarily sinful or selfish, but they just don't work. For instance, a lot of us try to find eternal fulfillment in having a family. And in our minds, we go, okay, so what will really will fulfill you is I'm going to have this big family. And this big family is going to remember me and love me. And my big family will continue on after me and they'll leave me this legacy. And that will bring my soul true fulfillment. Some of us try to find eternal purposes in big property. Like I'm going to own my dream house. And once I own my dream house, then my soul will really be fulfilled and satisfied. And I'll leave that big property to my descendants. And one day, Lord willing, I'll have great grandkids and they will come to my big property and I will convince them all to come for every Thanksgiving and Christmas. And that will bring my soul true fulfillment. And we've tried that, right? And if you even think this works with a parable that Jesus said of the rich man, right, who even told his soul, soul, You know, I'll build many barns, and then I'll find true satisfaction. Some of us trying to find eternal fulfillment in a big career. Like, you know, I'm going to have this job. I'm going to move up in this company, and that's going to bring my soul true fulfillment, and I'll be satisfied that I've done and made these great accomplishments in this career. And, And even one more, you know, some of us try to do it in big change. If you're trying to read that sign, that sign says tofu is murder. You know, not necessarily all of these things are wrong. It's not wrong to want big changes, especially when those big changes will benefit a lot of people. But many people will look to those things, will look to these movements, will look to the next bandwagon this week and say, as long as I jump on this bandwagon, as long as I help cause these changes, then my soul will truly be fulfilled. And I will finally get to sleep at night and I will no longer be looking for more because I found it. These things in themselves are not bad. But what's the problem with looking for eternal fulfillment in these things? The problem is, is that none of these things are eternal. How will these things fill up an eternal hole unless they're eternal themselves? They can't. Look back to chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 1, verse 10, the preacher says, Is there anything of which it can be said, see this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. You know, what about that big family that you're going to produce? You know what? They're going to forget about you one day. And they're not even going to care. And why should they? You'll get to a point where none of them even knew you. You know, Sarah got a picture of our family with Ruby and Archer being added and gave it to mom for some occasion. And I was looking at the picture and I joked to mom. I said, you know, Lord willing, Ruby will be like a great grandmother one day. And her descendants, my descendants, may have that picture. And you know what they'll say? They'll say, well, there's your great grandmother, Ruby. There's your great uncle Archer. But all those other people, I have no idea who they are. You know why I know that's true? Because I do the same thing at my Nana's house. Oh, there's my great grandmother, but I don't know who those other people are. And I don't care. And not to their fault. And frankly, guess what? Not to my fault either. Why should I know? I've never met them. And every year, there's less and less people in this world that did know them. And that's how my descendants are one day going to talk about me. Is a big family going to keep me eternal? No. What about that big property? What about that dream house? 
in 50 years, someone's going to bulldoze my dream house and put a Walgreens or a Dollar General on top of it. That's what's going to happen to my dream property. Is that eternal? No. What about that big career? What if you're very important in the job that you work at? And a lot of stuff has to get by you to happen. When you die, are they going to remember you? No, when you die, they're going to try to replace you the next day. And and that's going to be the most they're going to remember this big career. What about big change? Well, maybe we can find some solace there, right? You know, if I do something impressive, if I make the world a better place, well, that will bring me true eternity. But look in chapter 9. Here's a young man or a, a poor man that made a great accomplishment. And look what Solomon said his end result was. Verse 13 of chapter 9. This wisdom I have also seen under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There once was a little city with a few men in it, and a great king came against it, besieged it, and built a great snares around it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. We can pause. You know, here's a great accomplishment, a great change. This poor man faced a great king and saved his city. Well, certainly he will be remembered, right? But look what the next phrase says. Yet no one remembered that same poor man. You know, we can make great accomplishments and great changes, but even those things are not eternal. People will come and reverse them, or at least people will forget that we made those changes. None of these things work. And so we can't go to them to stop looking for more. All we'll do is continue to toss and turn at night looking for something more. So we've handled what we're we're all striving for something more. We answered why we're all striving for something more, which is because God put eternity in our hearts. And now here, finally, what was God's purpose in putting eternity in our hearts? Well, I think Paul actually answers that for us in Acts 17. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to have it up on the screen. You can turn there if you like. In Acts 17, Paul explains this to us very well. You know, and the thought is, is since our hearts strive for eternal purpose, then what can we find eternal fulfillment in? Because we've talked about everything that's wrong, but what's the one thing that's right? And when Paul's preaching to the Athenians, he sees that they have an idol on every street block. You know, they've tried to make their own things to find eternal fulfillment in these idols. And Paul says, look, you can't find eternal fulfillment in these idols. You're going to have to find eternal fulfillment in something better. And this is what Paul says in Acts 17. He says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries of their dwellings. What is the thought? God has made all men everywhere for all time. He's made them all from one blood. And can we not say from Ecclesiastes 3, and with all these humans, what has God done? He has put eternity into every single one of their hearts. Why has God put eternity into every single one of their hearts? The next verse. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. What's the purpose of putting eternity in our heart? It's so that we would all know, I need to be seeking for something. God has the hope that we would be smart enough or humble enough to say, well, let me try God. Maybe God will bring me true fulfillment. And what do people find? They find that the only thing that can fill an eternal hole is an eternal God. You've heard people say things like everybody worships something. Now, where does that thought come from? It comes from this concept, that everyone is looking for some type of fulfillment. And what we all have to do is come to terms with is the only thing that can fulfill eternal fulfillment is eternal God. And God's hopes was that that we would do that. That last line, though he is not far from each one of us, the thought there is it's not hard to do that. God's in arm reach. He's made himself such. And then, of course, the last bit, for in him we live and move and have our being. 
as some of your own poets have said, for we is his offspring. You know, I, I don't have a rock song for verse 28, but I do have a good song. What good song do we get verse 28 from? In him we move and live and have our being. Is that not the chorus of our God, he is alive? In him we live and we survive. You know, the only way I can save my eternal soul or my living soul is to put my hope and my trust in my living God because he's the only eternal thing that my eternal self can attach itself to. And once we find that, then we try find true eternal purpose, true eternal fulfillment. Hopefully this has been helpful to you some way. And just an observation from God's word that I think helps us better understand ourselves. If there's anyone here tonight that, that does acknowledge that, that they need something more, you know, could I suggest to you Jesus Christ, uh, who many of the apostles say fills all in all. If there's anyone here that needs a relationship with Jesus Christ, why don't you let us assist you if you will come forward as we stand and sing.